it's a deadly disease uh, that lives in the soil everywhere, right? Yeah, like that. I mean, what could be more fun? Just a wee bit of housekeeping first. October 19th is the open house. Everybody has it on their calendars, right? Pull out your phones right now, put it on there. Highway will be here. Uh, if you haven't already gotten your copy of the book, which I think you all have, there's more for sale in the back for you on the internet. That's Adventures of the Horse Doctor's Husband by international best-selling author Justin Boyd Long. <laughs> and the crowd goes wild. <laughs> uh, so this evening we have Dr. Lyman here talking to us about botulism, and I've already asked him a ton of questions, so he's primed and ready for all of our questions when he's all set and done. So. I learned a lot just sitting here speaking with him about it, and I can't wait to learn even more. So without further ado, Dr. Lyman. Okay. All right, guys. My name is Joe Lyman. I'm an equine veterinarian. I was in private practice for about 12 years in Lexington, Kentucky, uh, before I decided to figure out what this whole weekend thing people kept talking about was. Uh, join Neogen. I've been with Neogen about five years now. Uh, and tonight we're going to talk about equine botulisms. Uh, equine botulism is a disease that is highly prevalent in the Kentucky area. So this is kind of near and dear to my heart, something I dealt with in practice quite a bit. It's a lot less common here. So we're going to try to educate you on the disease and uh, hopefully everyone will come away with some understanding of what the risk factors are. It is not zero risk in Florida like some people like to think. Uh, it is certainly something you need to pay attention to. If you have any questions as we go through, just shoot your hand up. We'll ask or answer them when you're asking them rather than trying to wait to the end or something like that. So don't be shy. What I want to start off with here is a little video. And I want you to watch this video and think, if you saw your horse acting like this horse, what would you call the veterinarian and say your horse is doing? Can everyone agree that the horse doesn't look normal? Okay. So what are you going to say this horse is doing? Oh, Yell it out. i got a fan up here. Colic. 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 Absolutely. All right. Okay. So that's what most people see. And if you watch the end here when the horse goes down. Most people see that and they say my horse is colic. Right. And if you call your veterinarian, you're going to say my horse is colic. It's not real severe yet. You might say this is mild colic. You might get some advice to give it some banamine, something like that, to call back a little later. Well, this is an early botulism case. Okay? This horse died 24 hours later. If this horse dies and hasn't seen any therapy or any diagnostics, you don't say my horse died of botulism. You say my horse died of colic. Right? And the reason that's important is we get asked very often, how common is botulism? And the answer is we really don't know. It's not a reportable disease. Uh, there are no gross lesions seen at necropsy. So if you send this horse off for diagnostics afterwards, unless you specifically request botulism testing, all you get back is an inconclusive answer. So we think there are a lot more botulism cases out there than are actually reported or that people recognize as botulism. Uh, in Sweden, where they feed a lot of haylage and they actually see a lot of botulism, they insure almost every horse over there. And so there, we actually do know the statistics. And the attack rate over there is 7 per 10,000 horses. That's a really high number. It's probably about a quarter of that at most in the US because we don't feed the same high risk feeds that they feed over there. So what is this disease? Uh, botulism is a neurologic disease. That means it's a, uh, attacking the nervous system. Uh, Botulism can affect just about every animal, humans included. In humans, botulism is actually one of the leading causes of food poisoning. Uh, botulism is the reason you do all the things you do when you're canning food, right? When you uh, boil your jars and those sorts of things, which you're trying to prevent is botulism in food. Uh, it is extremely rapid. Uh, we see cases where the horse is normal in the morning, dead by the next morning. Uh, but in general, it's about two to three days for the normal disease course. Uh, and it's caused by bacterial toxin. And that's really important to understand as we move on through the talk. It's not an infection, it's an intoxication. So this is really a poisoning that the horses are getting, not so much an infection by a bacteria. Uh, 
but that toxin is produced by a bacteria called Clostridium botulinum. And Clostridium botulinum is related to a number of other really nasty bacteria like Clostridium tetani that causes tetanus, Clostridium perfringens that causes really nasty diarrhea, especially in foals, uh, Clostridium shovii or dovii, things you see causing black leg in cattle if you've ever heard of that. Uh, this class of bacteria is famous for producing toxins that cause really nasty disease. Uh, it's an anaerobic bacteria, and that means it likes to grow when there's no or very little oxygen present. And that trait is actually what gives us most of the risk factors that are associated with equine botulism. Uh, but when it doesn't have a nice uh, large amount of organic matter and it doesn't have an anaerobic environment, it forms spores. Okay? And what spores are are basically little packages of bacteria uh, that are hanging out waiting for conditions for growth. And we get asked sometimes how long those spores can last. And the answer is nobody knows because it's probably somewhere in excess of tens of thousands of years. Uh, there are spores from some classes of bacteria that have been reanimated that they estimate are hundreds of millions of years old. So the answer is the clostridial spores are waiting and they'll outweigh all of us to find conditions for growth. Okay? And if you're in an endemic area, and I'll show you a map a little later on what an endemic area is, you can be virtually guaranteed that a soil sample in an endemic area will be positive for spores. It's that common. There are some areas of the country, like Baltimore, where it's so prevalent that there are spores present in the air, and human infants can inhale them and develop botulism simply from that exposure. Uh, so when it's, there are conditions that aren't conducive to growth, when there's oxygen there, when it's a little cold, uh, if you have an acidic pH, uh, those conditions will drive them towards spore formation, right? And they're waiting there until they see conditions for growth. Once they start growing, they call that the vegetative state, then they start producing toxin. So the conditions for growth are the exact opposite then. Warmer temperatures, somewhere around body temp, uh, slightly wet, uh, low oxygen present, you'll actually start to see these sorts of uh, toxins produced. And in, I want you to think about where you might see those conditions on a horse farm because those are your risk factors. Everything is tied to where you see these sorts of conditions, right? Uh, I went to the University of Illinois. At Illinois, the entire lecture we got on equine botulism was, if you feed round bales, you should vaccinate your horse. That was it. Uh, if you read textbooks, that's the classic risk factor that people give. And the reason for that is based on the uh, preparation of a round bale, right? The round bale is heavily compressed. The inside remains slightly more damp than the outside. If it's heavily compressed enough and there are spores present, you get a little bit of decomposition and that fermentation allows for the heat to come up and you get conditions for growth of botulinum. But we don't just see that with round bales. We've seen that associated with square bales, both large and small square bales. Uh, we've seen it in dried hay cubes that actually got wet in, during storage. We've seen it with pelleted feeds. We've seen it with sweet feeds. Uh, really, anything that goes in a horse's mouth can actually develop these conditions. Yes? It's, uh, so the question was, doesn't uh, the extrusion process for pelleted feed kill the uh, bacteria? It would kill the vegetative form. If they were currently growing, it would. But it's not enough to kill uh, the spores themselves. Uh, so really, any feed can be a problem. In fact, there is a, uh, a case that I read once from California where grass clippings were enough to uh, develop botulism. And in that case, it was at a state park that had mowed, and there were some horses in a field adjoining the state park. Some people who were visiting the state park thought it would be nice to feed the horses, so they picked up the grass clippings and fed them and killed three horses by doing that. So uh, really, any sort of decaying matter is enough to grow botulism if there are spores present. Uh, we also see this associated with carcass contamination of feeds. So have any of you ever seen a carcass in a bale of hay? 
Yeah, if you didn't raise your hand, it's because you're not feeding your horse, uh, right? It's a very common thing to get carcass contamination in hay. And that decaying matter is also enough for botulism to start to grow. Uh, and then we'll talk a little later in the talk, there are two specific conditions where we see this actually uh, in inside foals where they're able to uh, grow botulism themselves. Uh, and we see it associated with wounds sometimes. But when we see this growth occurring, we get production of this neurotoxin. And the neurotoxin is a very, very scary toxin. Uh, they've estimated that one pint of purified neurotoxin would be enough to wipe off every human on the planet. So it doesn't take much more than the bottle of water that you have in your hand of purified toxin to be lethal to all people. Uh, they say that one gram, which is just about a half a teaspoon, is enough to kill uh, one of the 400,000 cows. Uh, horses are 10 times more susceptible to the toxin than cows are, which would mean that one gram of purified toxin would be enough to kill roughly 4 million horses. That's about half of the total horse inventory in the United States. Uh, and one colony, so have you ever seen the bacteriological plates, the little red auger plates, and they have all the little dots on them? Each one of those dots is one colony. One colony can produce 10,000 lethal doses in 24 hours. The reason that's really important is sometimes we have discussions with owners who will say things like, well, I'm not feeding spoiled hay, or everything looks fine, the bale looked good. The whole bale doesn't need to be rotten to be a risk for botulism. Only one small part had to be appropriate for conditions of growth. And those conditions don't still need to be present when you feed it to your horse. It's not a hot bale that's necessarily toxic. It just has to have been hot at some point during the storage that allowed for production of the toxin. But the toxin's very stable, and it'll be around for years after those conditions. Okay. So it's not something that's visible necessarily as a risk. We don't need big moldy bales to be botulism bales. Uh, they can be perfectly normal appearing bales. There are eight different types of the botulinum neurotoxin. A, B, and C are really the only ones we worry about in horses. And the vast majority are type B, somewhere between 85 and 90 percent really are uh, type B cases. We do see A and C occasionally. A tends to be very rapid uh, paracute cases and really only in the uh, arid west. And then type C, when we do see them, are almost always associated with carcass poison or carcass contamination. Uh, but we don't see those very often. Type A is actually the exact same toxin that is Botox. So this highly nasty and disgusting toxin is what uh, Tatum puts in her head so that she looks all young. She's looking great. Uh, so. Uh, that is the very toxin that people are using for cosmetics. It is that lethal. Obviously, they use very, very small amounts when they're doing Botox. Um, but something to be aware of. So I'm going to try to make this not too complicated because I get confused on it sometimes as well. But uh, the way the toxin works is it acts at what's called the neuromuscular end plate or sometimes called the neuromuscular junction. So where the nerve cell ends, and the muscle cell starts. There's a small gap there. And it, that gap, normally, when the signal comes down the nerve cell, you get stimulation of a release of a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. And acetylcholine goes across that little gap, and it binds to receptors on the muscle cell, and it tells the muscle cell to contract. Okay? That's the normal system. And the way it works in the nerve cell is there are these things called snare proteins. And the snare proteins are there kind of waiting to just snap the little vesicles that have that neurotransmitter in them down to the membrane so that they can go across. This all happens in fractions of a second. Uh, that's the normal system. What happens when botulinum neurotoxin is present is that those snare proteins are destroyed. So the signal is conducted all the way down the nerve cell, but when it gets to the very end of the nerve cell, the signal can't make it across to the muscle cell via that neurotransmitter. Okay? So the nerve itself is undamaged except for the very end, and then it just can't signal for any contraction of the muscle cell on the other side. So what happens is once you get enough of those muscle fibers affected, 
is that you develop what's called a flaccid paralysis. Okay, so if you think of tetanus, which most people are a little familiar with, where everything's contracted and it won't let go, that's a spastic paralysis. Flaccid paralysis is the exact opposite. The horse is paralyzed because it can't move, because it can't contract any muscles to do so. Okay? Is that making sense to everyone? Good. All right, so where do we need to worry about this? Uh, so Virginia Tech took some students, uh, they gave them a shovel and a backpack, and they sent them hiking across the country. They may have given them a car, I don't know, it's Virginia. Uh, and they had them take soil samples every 25 miles, or 50 miles, sorry, um, across the United States in four separate lines. And they looked for the presence of botulism spores as they did that. And what they found is that type A, like I said before, it's pretty much out in the dry west that they would see type A uh, botulism spores present. And we don't see a whole lot of botulism cases, even though there's fairly high concentration of type A. Uh, those just aren't common to see in the horse environment. Type B, on the other hand, was a little more distributed, but you can see east of the Mississippi, along Kentucky, in fact, every soil sample that they took in Kentucky was positive for uh, clostridium botulinum type B. And then up the Atlantic corridor, you start to see a lot more cases. And this is an important map because uh, this is where people think they need to worry about botulism. And they're right, if you're in Kentucky, you'll see botulism cases. And if you're in those mid-Atlantic states, you'll see botulism cases. But when I show you later an incidence map where we actually have reported cases of type B botulism, it doesn't match this map. And that's really important to understand that what we've always classically thought of as the high-risk endemic areas aren't the only places that you'll actually see type B botulism. And the way your horse gets this, uh, there are three ways a horse can get equine botulism. Far and away, the most common one is what's called forage poisoning. Forage poisoning is just like food poisoning in people. It's that the horse ingests a feed that has the toxin already formed in it, and then they absorb the toxin. It acts on those neuromuscular junctions, and the horse becomes paralyzed. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we see this with just about every potential type of feed stuff that can go in a horse. Uh, grass and hay, uh, pelleted feeds, sweet feeds, haylage or silage, which are uh, fermented feeds, are extremely high risk. Uh, in the fermentation process, you're actually making conditions that are really close to growth of uh, Clostridium botulinum. And what usually happens with fermented feeds is that people are trying to do the right thing and keep it from uh, being spoiled, so they dry it down a little farther than they should. And by removing that moisture, the fermentation is incomplete, and so the uh, pH doesn't drop rapidly enough to prevent growth of botulism spores. Uh, the other route that uh, we see often in Kentucky, I don't know that I've ever heard of a toxico infectious case from Florida, but uh, they used to call this shaker foal syndrome. And in this case, in high endemic areas, the foals, just by exploring their normal environment, actually pick up spores and swallow them. And when they do that, the conditions inside the foals gastrointestinal tract are appropriate for growth. And you actually get production of the neurotoxin inside of the foal. And they absorb it and start to show the same signs. And then there's wound botulism. So this is when any sort of contaminated wound, and I'll always ask this when I'm giving it in endemic areas, how many of you have had a horse with a wound? Okay, again, if your hand's not up, you don't own a horse. Uh, how many of you have ever seen a horse with a dirty wound? Okay, yes. All right, they're all dirty by the time we get to them. Uh, if you're in high-risk areas, you can almost guarantee that that wound has been seeded with botulism spores if it has any contamination on it. Now, most wounds still have a good amount of oxygen. Everything's fine. Uh, and they don't develop wound botulism. But if you get that wound where it becomes necrotic, you'd have dying tissue and low oxygen penetration, then you have conditions for growth, and you can actually get production of the neurotoxin within the wound itself. Yes? So the question was, is that an argument against bandaging? Um, unless you really have to. No, it would not be. And the reason for that is the oxygen's not coming from the outside environment. The oxygen's coming from 
blood itself. So you're okay to still cover it. Uh, I think I would be asked to leave if I said not to bandage your wounds. So. Was there another? Yes. Yeah, so the question is about whether there's any liability for the producers of the feed when you've got a, a botulism case associated with that feed. And which brings us back to the food Yeah, and we'll talk about diagnostics a little bit. You can do PCR testing on feedstuffs and, and identify it. The problem is it's hard to, uh, especially if it's coming from an endemic area, prove that the uh, conditions for growth occurred when it was in the hands of the producer of the feed. So uh, if they produce the feed, but then you store it on the floor and it gets wet and you get conditions for growth, that's not on the feed company, that's on the person storing it. So uh, I know that's a frequent investigation that's done, especially in large outbreaks, but I'm not aware of too many cases where it's actually gone back to the feed company. Uh, yes? Those stored Yeah, so the question is, if the horse consumes a feed that has spores in it, but there have never been conditions to allow for growth, is the horse safe? And the answer is yes. Spores pass through horses all day, every day, without any incident. Uh, it's only when you have conditions for growth that the neurotoxin is produced. No, full, it's not so much that they kill the spores. In fact, the spore can go all the way through a horse and come out still viable on the other side. Uh, Exactly. So the conditions, they're more acidic in an adult horse. Uh, you have less areas of uh, low oxygen present in them. So uh, you're very, there are a couple cases in adults that have been reported in the toxico infectious route, but they're both cases uh, following college surgeries where you had stasis of the gut that allowed for different conditions. Okay, so what does botulism look like? This is where it gets a little more fun. Uh, we will see clinical signs develop in horses that have consumed neurotoxin within hours to days after ingestion in the feed. Uh, and the more toxin that they consume, the more severe the signs will be and the more rapidly they will progress through those signs. Early on, the first things we're going to see are decreased uh, tongue tone, decreased eyelid tone, and decreased tail tone. And I'll show you some videos of these in a second. And then those will progress on to more generalized signs of weakness. Uh, some people mistake it for lameness. And then the horses will actually become recumbent. Uh, once the horse becomes recumbent, things get really bad very quickly. Uh, recumbent adult horses are a medical emergency. And so these aren't things that can readily be managed at home. These all need to be hospitalized if they progress to that point. Uh, so. Being a repro vet in Kentucky, I spent my life at the back end of a horse. Any of you that have ever tried to take a horse's temperature, is it generally that easy to just lift their tail up and down, right? So these horses with decreased tail tone, you can just move that tail anywhere you want. There's almost no resistance to it at all. How many of you have ever tried to put eye medicine in a horse? Super easy, right? Yeah. Uh, they have the strength of 10,000 men in their eyelids. Uh, these horses have such reduced tone that you can just flick their eyelid up and down. This sign is present in 95% of botulism cases. And so it's one of the things that veterinarians can use as an early screening test when they see a neurologic and they're wondering whether they could be looking at a botulism. This is one of the first things they look for. And this video is what's called the grain test. Uh, veterinarians like really fancy terms that are hard to understand. So uh, the grain test is very complicated. You take a handful of grain and you offer it to the horse. Okay. So how long does a normal horse take to make a handful of grain disappear? Uh, 
a second, right? So a horse that has botulism, because they've got paralysis of the tongue and the muscles in the back of the throat, they will apprehend the feed normally, but as they try to chew it, they actually can't coordinate all the muscles to get it to the back of their throat and swallow it. So when you watch this video, this is an early botulism case. If you saw your horse doing this in a stall, what would you call and say? Choke, absolutely, okay? So early botulism is frequently mistaken for choke because they see horses doing this. The horses are still interested in feet. They still want as much as they can. They just can't do anything to coordinate those muscle movements to actually swallow. And this is a horse on grass. It's a very short video, but uh, doing the exact same thing. This is actually a recovering botulism case. Okay. So now that uh, you've heard a little bit more about botulism, let's talk about this horse again. So you notice a few things about this horse. It's not really able to lift its head up, right? Its neck stays pretty much horizontal or lower through almost the entire video. It's taking very short steps because it doesn't want to shift its weight forward. If it does, it's going to collapse, right? Uh, the horse doesn't really look that painful. We've actually always been taught classically that botulism is not a painful disease. Uh, there are some cases in the human side where people have received inadvertently large doses of neurotoxin in the quest for beauty, uh, and they describe it as associated with intense pain, so we've changed our thinking on it a little bit. We do think it is a slightly painful disease now, and we do see horses respond to pain management when they're uh, botulism cases, so that's changed a little bit. But this horse isn't colicking, right? The reason it went down at the end is it was tired, it was weak, it tried to lay down, and it couldn't control its rate of descent, right? So as soon as it decided to open those joints, it just collapses down to the ground. Now, once the horse has become recumbent, like I said earlier, you've got a pretty dire emergency at this point, and the prognosis goes way down after you get to recumbency. Uh, death in these horses is usually gonna come between 48 and 72 hours, and the real scary part about botulism is that the reason they die from botulism is once the diaphragm has become compromised, they can't breathe anymore. So death from botulism is death by suffocation. It's a pretty awful thing to actually watch a horse go through. Foals will do pretty much the same thing. Um, they're able to stay on their feet a little bit longer, and they get a lot of muscle fasciculations, kind of twitching muscles. That's where the name shaker foal syndrome came from. Uh, but they also do that kind of plop down, they call it. Remember, I said veterinarians like really fancy terms. Uh, and they will also progress on to recumbency. Uh, foals in recumbency are a little easier to manage. They're still intensive care. They still need to be hospitalized. Uh, but foals can be a little more easily managed. So how are we going to diagnose this disease? Pretty much everything we do for diagnosis is based on presentation of those clinical signs and history. Okay. Uh, we look at whether the horse has been vaccinated for botulism. We look at whether it's eating any high-risk feeds or is in a high-risk area. Um, and then we try to rule out all of the other neurologics. These horses don't generally run fevers, so that rules out a lot of the infectious neurologic diseases like herpes virus where we usually see real high um, uh, fevers associated with them. It's always symmetrical, so we see the exact same severity of clinical signs on both sides of the horse. That makes it easier because that also rules out a lot of the other neurologic diseases. Um, and then based on region, things like white muscle disease may be prevalent in some areas, not others. But we can generally rule out a lot of the other neurologics. Um, and then based on that history, that's enough for us to start treating a horse. Uh, and the reason is the diagnostics that we have aren't very quick. And so by the time we would actually get a diagnostic answer back on a botulism case, the horse would be dead. So we need to start treating it as soon as we see those clinical signs. Uh, the old test for this was a, a very glamorous test where they actually took some fractions of either blood or digesta uh, and injected that in the mice and watched the mice to see whether they died of botulism. Uh, that test isn't very commonly run anymore, and pretty much everyone has gone over the PCR test. But the PCR test takes about three to five days to get a result back. And the problem with the PCR test is it doesn't actually test for the presence of toxin. It tests for the presence of Clostridium botulinum, the bacteria, 
And so if you're in high risk areas, you'll have cases where, just like you asked earlier, the spores are there, therefore the DNA is there, and you get a positive PCR, but you never necessarily had conditions for growth of the neurotoxin. So it's not necessarily the same thing when you get a positive PCR result. Just why would you run it? Well, exactly to your question. You're usually going to look for confirmation because you have other horses on the facility and you're worried about the risk associated to those horses. Uh, and so if you can identify it in that single case to know that it was a botulism and then go around looking for what the feed source was that contributed to it so you know how to take action on your farm. So what is treatment? Number one, stop feeding them toxin. Uh, that one seems fairly obvious. Uh, but this becomes a big logistic problem because if you believe that hay on your farm contributed to botulism in that horse and you're worried about other horses on your farm, how much hay do you throw out? Right, so the answer was quarantine that hay, feed a new source of hay until you can test that and verify that it's clean. That absolutely will work. Not everybody has an available feed source to immediately have quarantine. So you're right, that would work. But this becomes a big discussion for people, and it kind of comes down to how much risk you want to assume, how much hay or of that feed source do you discard. Uh, and that's a question we get very often. For my money, the answer is all of it and start over. Uh, but in the end, it all comes down to a question of economics. How much can you reasonably afford to throw away and how readily available is an alternate feed source to those animals? We're also going to administer antitoxin to a botulism horse. This poses a problem for you in Florida because nobody in Florida is going to stock botulinum antitoxin because you don't see it very often. And botulinum neurotoxin will, or antitoxin will only bind circulating toxin. So the stuff that's already bound, you can't do anything about, but you can prevent any more from binding to those muscles. Uh, and then we'll give antibiotics to these horses. They frequently will get aspiration pneumonia. They get pressure sores from being down. We give them mineral oil, usually because we both want to speed up the transition of that food through the gut and get it out of them so they aren't absorbing any more toxin from it. Uh, and we're also worried about their guts slowing down and them developing a secondary impaction. Uh, and then IV fluids, because these horses aren't able to stand or drink correctly. Uh, pretty intensive management on them. That antitoxin, it's critical to get it in them as quickly as possible. Uh, the earlier you use it, the better. Uh, very rarely you'll have to go back and do a second dose of antitoxin because there's still more toxin being absorbed by that horse from the, the feed that they have in their guts. Uh, there are a couple of commercially available ones, uh, but again, you're not going to see it in Florida. I, I can't imagine where the nearest, maybe Virginia, Tennessee. Uh, do they? Okay, so you, you, UF actually stocks it. That's good to know. So that you guys are in great shape. It's close. Uh, so from the time you get that diagnostic, though, or the diagnosis to the time you actually pick that up, get back to the farm to deliver it, or if you're shipping the case in. It can be a fairly hefty chunk of time before the horse actually received antitoxin. So, uh, like I mentioned earlier, the faster a horse progresses through clinical signs towards recumbency uh, is an indication that if they've consumed a higher dose, uh, and that is a negative prognosis. So a horse that very rapidly becomes recumbent has a worse prognosis than a horse that kind of lingers in those early stages. Uh, foals that received antitoxin promptly in a study that was done in Kentucky, I believe, 90% uh, of those foals recovered, and that's great news. Uh, the problem is in that study, 50% required oxygen therapy and 30% required mechanical ventilation. There aren't a whole lot of facilities that are set up to run 24-hour full-time mechanical ventilation of foals in the United States. Uh, it, uh, the iron lung, right, the respirator where you see it going in and out form, uh, that means a machine was breathing for that foal for the entire time it was on mechanical ventilation. Exactly. The diaphragm is paralyzed and it's not functioning correctly in those horses. So, uh, so 
in mechanical ventilation long term for adult horses is an impossibility really we don't have any way to do that full time so so the 90 percent recovery that we see in foals it's good news but it's also very expensive news right because you have extremely high amounts of therapy being delivered to these horses uh, when Penn looked at this problem, what they figured out is that uh, horses that stayed standing while they were at the uh, clinic were much more likely to go home, and that would make sense, right? 43% um, of the horses remained standing, and they had a 95% survival rate in those horses that stayed standing while they were receiving treatment. So the good news is if the horse is still on its feet, it's highly likely that you're going to be able to keep it there if you've administered anatoxin and, and instituted treatment rapidly. What's interesting in that study though is 67% of the horses arrived standing. That means that 67% of the horses came in on their feet, received anatoxin and appropriate therapy, and only 43% stayed up. A quarter of the horses that came in received appropriate therapy and still became recumbent. Okay? And once that horse became recumbent, they only had a 20% chance of survival. So only one in five horses that gets down from botulism gets to go home, and that's from full hospitalization. If the horse is already recumbent on your facility before you're trying to ship, it's an extremely great prognosis. And then we get to talk about the cost associated with this. So how many of you have ever hospitalized a horse? Super cheap, right? 50, 100 bucks a day, it's like going to Hampton Inn. Uh, no, this is extremely expensive, right? The average duration of stay in that pen study was 10 days, I believe, uh, with probably seven of that being ICU care. You're talking two to $3,000 a day right off the top just to be in the ICU getting, and that's seven to 10 days. It's very common to see bills associated with treatment of botulism of $20,000 or higher. And remember, that's with a 20% chance that the horse gets to go home. So it's entirely possible with botulism cases to have a $25,000 bill and no horse at the end of it. Uh, and the point of that isn't to really terrify you too much, but to drive home that the only appropriate way to manage a disease like that is through prevention, not through attempts at cure. Uh, and there are ways we could prevent it uh, without vaccination, right? We could try to feed good quality feeds properly stored, uh, keep feed off the ground so it doesn't have any risk associated with high organic load where they've tra or trampled it down into the ground, especially if it gets wet. So we can try to use good feed practices and we can try to feed good quality feeds. Uh, how many of you grow your own hay? Yeah, okay, so for you on Facebook, there are no hands up in the room. Uh, so it's really difficult for you to know whether or not all of the stuff that's going into your horse's mouth has been appropriately processed and appropriately stored before it gets to you. Uh, so, uh, obviously the toxico-infectious route, you guys don't really have to worry about too much down here. Um, if you could prevent foals from exploring their environment, licking the ground and licking fence posts, uh, you could reasonably control the toxico-infectious route. I don't think that's gonna be very possible. I think we have a question. He's talking about carbon systems in the hay. Mm -hmm. Are you, I'm assuming you're talking about rats and mice and things of that sort. Kind of Do you recommend throwing away that bale of hay, or do you have that effect from it? Or? Yeah, so the question is if you have carcass contamination, do you throw out that bale? I would throw out that bale and every bale that was around it in my stack uh, because you don't know whether you've got any cross contamination associated with it. Um, that's just me being abundantly cautious, but um, 100 bucks worth of hay is a lot less cost than most people's horses. So, uh, Wound botulism, you could certainly prevent wound botulism by making sure that no horse ever gets a wound and it never gets contaminated. If you can figure that one out, I'm right all ears, I really want to hear it. Uh, but again, wound botulism, you can assume in endemic areas that horses will have spores in their wounds. Uh, and so. You, know, you really don't have any good choice there with the exception of vaccination. Uh, Botvax B, I did not make that slide, so you'll have to apologize the cheese ball animation. Uh, Botvax B is the only licensed uh, vaccine for equine botulism. Uh, this is only protective against type B. There's actually no cross protection 
uh, in the vaccine against type A or type C, good news is pretty much every case you're going to see of botulism in horses is caused by type B. Uh, we start with a three-dose initial series and then an annual booster after that. Uh, we have different protocols for whether or not it's going into a broodmare or previously vaccinated adult. Uh, your veterinarian is the best one to discuss what the appropriate interval of time and timing of dose is. Um, the AAP, uh, the organization that all of us equine veterinarians belong to, uh, says this is what's called a risk-based vaccine. So there are core vaccines that the AAP says every horse should get. And risk-based vaccines, it's up to you as the owner to have a discussion with your veterinarian as to whether or not your horse is at risk and is an appropriate candidate for vaccination. So really all I'm asking for out of this talk is have that discussion with your veterinarian and find out whether your horse is at risk and whether or not it's an appropriate candidate. Uh, kind of tough to see up there, I know for all of you. Uh, risk-based vaccines are kind of a funny thing. There are risk-based vaccines on there that include things like uh, anthrax. Anyone here vaccinate for anthrax? No, okay. Uh, Potomac horse fever is also on the list. I'm assuming nobody in Florida vaccinates for Potomac. Yeah. Uh, influenza is also a risk-based vaccine. How many here vaccinate for influenza? Yes. How many of you ever saw a horse die from influenza? Not very common, right? It's a risk-based vaccine because we know that horses who see other horses are highly likely to get influenza. Uh, but relative to botulism, it's a relatively low impact disease, right? It's a big impact in large groups of horses. It decreases training time, it makes it hard to get them back on the track or back in performance. Uh, but botulism is a disease that's actually a, a deeply deadly disease. If you vaccinate your horse for influenza, I strongly advise you have that conversation with your veterinarian about whether your horse should be vaccinated for botulism. So I told you before I'd show you a map. Uh, this is just a map I put together of cases that I talked to veterinarians who had diagnosed botulism. And these are all type B botulism cases. You'll notice Alaska is included on that. Uh, the dark blue is where we actually saw cases of botulism. And the reason I point this out is it does not match the map of what we consider the high risk endemic areas. We see type B botulism cases all over the US. How is that possibly occurring if I'm saying that we don't really have type B botulism in those areas? Absolutely. So the answer uh, from our model student up front, you got A's in school, didn't you? <laughs> uh, is that we ship feed, right? Feed is shipped from endemic areas into non-endemic areas, and that poses risk. We also ship horses from non-endemic areas into endemic areas to show, race, trail ride, you name it. Uh, and so even if you live in a non-endemic area, you have to look at whether or there are risk behaviors associated with the way you manage those horses. Uh, this was a map I inherited when I first came to Neogen. This is back uh, in one year from 2008 to 2009. Uh, one of the biggest, most high profile cases of equine botulism actually happened here in Florida. Again, I know you can't probably read that back there. 114 horses died, 258 horses were treated with anatoxin. Anatoxin is going to run you about 500 bucks a pop. So they treated a couple hundred thousand dollars by the time they were done on treatment of those horses uh, in just anatoxin administration alone and they lost 114. The reason I bring that up is another scary aspect of botulism is that it almost always happens in outbreaks, right? Multiple horses on the farm are eating from the same feed source. And so you often see multiple horses affected at the same time. That makes this a really scary disease where everything's fine in the morning and you come home to a bunch of neurologic horses in the afternoon. Uh, in my practice in Kentucky, uh, yes, we've got another question. Oh, the blue? Yeah. Okay, on your earlier map, you mentioned the GHS being better. Colorado, for example, on the eastern lower side of the state, was an endemic area. Yeah. But there are no cases of botulism in the yeah. Not necessarily. Is it just in one year? Uh, yeah, it is very dry, so. 
Yeah, so you'll see spores all over the country. Uh, and you'll see type B, incidentally, in all sorts of areas. And there are sometimes little pockets. Uh, some things we know from Europe is that areas where animals have been raised for long periods of time are more likely to have more spores. They concentrate spores because they're eating feed and uh, passing them out. Uh, so just because it appeared on the map as a, a single spot doesn't mean that's a real hotbed. Um, yeah, so, you know, again, where we, we see really high risk is the Ohio River Valley and the Mid-Atlantic states. Um, it's got the correct pH, it's got the correct amount of organic matter present in the soil to really have the uh, high botulinum content. So. so in my practice, uh, what I recommended vaccinating, we vaccinated performance horses because the loss associated with a horse that they've invested significant amounts of time and effort in is severe. Horses that recover from botulism can return to athletic performance. It's very rarely back to the level of performance they had prior to the incident. Uh, and the complications associated with it, the pressure sores all the way down to uh, further neurologic damage from the pressure of being down for long periods of time uh, can be limiting factors in their performance. So any performance horse I recommended, uh, any breeding stock, especially because I was practicing in an endemic area, had to be vaccinated. Any horses being fed in high-risk fashion or high-risk feed, so things like brown bales, large compressed square bales, um, horses being fed on the ground, horses being fed in uh, dirt lots as opposed to pasture, those were all high-risk things that I would discuss that with the owners. And then this sounds funny, but remember I practiced in Lexington, Kentucky, where it's not a foregone conclusion, but any horse that has sentimental value, I always recommended those owners vaccinate. Um, like I talked about earlier, the debt that these horses suffer is not something you want to see a horse go through. So I always advise that those owners consider this. Yes. You mentioned um, not really horses. Yeah. I'm sorry. What? Oh, for influenza, that's a risk factor, not for botulism. Not a, not a factor. Correct. Yeah. So the question was whether or not um, uh, horses that were in, uh, new to a facility or strange horses, co-mingling was a risk factor. It's not for postures. So, and the last thing, uh, I hate reading my slides, but I'm gonna go ahead and read this one to you. This is a quote from an article in the horse uh, back in 2009. Um, and I think it kind of wraps up the experience that horses have when they uh, go through a, a case of botulism. And it's only the motor nerves are affected, the ones that are responsible for muscle movement. As such, the sensory function is uh, left unimpaired. This means that victims of botulism will continue to experience hunger, thirst, fear, distended bladder, pain, and all other sensations, but they simply cannot move in response. And that's one of the really scary things about botulism. Most neurologic diseases that we worry about are central diseases. They affect the horse's brain, and they actually limit the amount of cognition they have. They're not thinking correctly. They're not experiencing things as they normally would. Botulism horses are only affected in the peripheral nerves. So the brain completely unaffected and those horses are completely aware of everything that's going around. They just can't do anything about it. Is anyone not terrified of botulism yet? All right. That is the end of the talk. Uh, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to address them now. Yes. So the question is, are there any risk factors associated with vaccination? There are no specific risk factors for this that aren't common to all vaccinations. So um, you will see occasional cases of uh, injection site reactions or mild fever after. That's common to everything you'll vaccinate a horse with. Um, the attack rate for this is uh, something like uh, one one hundredth of one percent. So um, it's a uh, extremely low attack rate for a vaccine. Any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. We'll be here a little after if anyone shy and wants to ask a question.